Welcome to FOSS North, the virtual edition. We would like to thank all our sponsors and partners in this difficult situation. Our gold sponsors, Luxoft and Ansible by Red Hat. Our silver sponsors, ITRS Group and Make It Right. Our base sponsors. Our partner projects, the open source community and the region of Gothenburg. And a huge thanks to our awesome community. This would not have been possible without you. So next up we welcome our uh, last speaker for the day, Patrick Feldström, who will be talking about keeping time. Um, Patrick is uh, a part of the team who actually connected Sweden to the internet, so he's been around for a while in, in these areas. Uh, pre-web, pre-javascript, pre the stuff that we associate with it today. Uh, welcome, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. So we'll try to talk about what, uh, how to know what time it is and uh, try to explain that it, it might be a little bit harder than what people think and give you some uh, ideas on how to uh, make it uh, more stable and actually know how much you know about the current time. So I'm technical director and head of security at NetNode. We have existed since 1996. And our role has always been to do things in a stable fashion, common infrastructure services. And among the services that we run is distribution of Swedish time and frequency. So anyone that would like to have stable time and frequency can connect to us using P2P, NTP or NTS. And I will talk a little bit more about NTS in the future. So time has been interesting since quite a long time ago. Uh, originally, time was, had something to do with, with, with the sun rotating around Earth, or as we knew after a while, Earth rotating along its own axis and then around the sun. But from the beginning, it was the sun that was moving. So we have these sundials all over the world. This is one of the oldest ones. But sundials is something that we also use today. This is the rover that is on March. And if you look here within the circle, you'll see something that is kind of funky. And the question is what that is. This is actually a sundial that, and also um, something that, that have different colors as you can see. And it's placed on the rover so that the idea is that it should exist in every photograph. Because by looking at the shadow, on the photo and also the colors, you can do compensation, not only of time when the photo was taken, but also calculation of, uh, of uh, uh, white balance and other kind of things in the photo that, is, uh, that can be hard otherwise. So sundials have been existing for a while and it's still in use, kind of cool, I think. But to measure time more precisely than a day, we started to use something like this. You had, you had these hour, these sort of, boxes and containers that with sand and the grains were approximately equal in size. So the speed was deterministic on how long time it took for all the sand to go from one container to another one. So you turn them around and then you know approximately how long time it would have taken, but this was not very precise. And uh, you still had to count how many times you had turned this upside down and, and that could be a little bit awkward and you could lose, lose track of that. So the question is then what time actually is. Time actually consists of two components. You have something that is ticking uh, like the, uh, the boxes of the sand container, and then you count the number of ticks. So this, this is a clock. You have a frequency, and then you have a counter. And those two together makes a clock. I will focus on the frequency, but of course counting is also difficult. Specifically, if you boot something up, you need to know when you start to count, what is zero? And, and you need to have agreement on that. And, uh, but it's kind of easy to understand what the tick is. So when talking about time, there are a couple of other concepts as well you need to look at. You need to look at correctness and precision. And you might have high precision or high correctness or uh, sorry, high precision, low precision, high correctness and high or low correctness. And you might combine these two and what you want is, of course, both high precision and high correctness. But that might be something that is a bit difficult to obtain. So sometimes it's better to have high precision and low correctness because then you can compensate. 
Uh, bad precision is a little bit more difficult to take care of, but you can always calculate some kind of average. Just like the old say is, a man with one clock know what time it is, but if you have two clocks, you don't. So if we look at frequency, uh, you, you, we can look at the distance in time between two peaks of frequency. And, and, and the time it takes between two of those peaks, we can define that as a unit of time. And the important thing for the frequency is that this works really, really well if the frequency is very, very stable. The more stable the frequency is, the better it is. And we have one of these units of time that we have been using, and that is, for example, the time it takes for Earth to rotate around its axis or the Earth to go around the sun. But as we'll see in a bit, that is not very stable frequency, but it's a good approximation. Nowadays, we use much better units of time, and that is, for example, that the SI definition of seconds has to do with the number of, of, of uh, the number of frequent, the number of um, um, vibrations of the cesium atom, at a special uh, cesium atom. And that is the definition of unit, that is the unit of time that we're using today. I'll come back to that. Um, we had a lot of trains uh, that needed uh, the same a good timetable. And originally, each city had their own time defined by when the sun was as high as possible than the time was noon. But over, after a while, it was agreed at, at a conference, the International Meridian Conference in, in 1884 in Washington, everyone, every country in the world or representatives of them, uh, as you see, all men in black suits, they agreed that we should have something called uh, universal time coordinated or UTC. We should have the same time and we should have time zones. So the time zones were defined at this conference. So in 1972, we introduced UTC that was based on the SI definition. And this forced us to come up with a couple of different time scales, which all are in use. We have the UT1, which is the universal time as defined by the earth rotation. And this is adjusted to polar rendering because the, the North Pole is walking around a little bit. You have the Earth itself is wobbling. We have earthquakes and other kind of things that makes things. And we have the moon that actually also uh, changes the Earth rotation. Then we have the TAI, that is International Atomic Time, that is defined as an average of the time kept by about 200 atomic clocks in over 50 national laboratories, one of them being in Borås in Sweden. And the difference between TAI and UT1 was approximately zero on January 1, 1958. Then we have UTC, which is a multiple numbers of SI seconds. And the thing is that if UTC differs from TA1, TAI, by an integral number of seconds, in that case, when needed, we add leap seconds in UTC, add or remove leap seconds, because the, we want the difference between UTC, which is based on the vibrations of cesium, and UT1, which is defined by the rotation of Earth. We want the difference to be less than 0 0.9 seconds. So TA1 is the actual average of time. UTC is what we are using, and UTC is seconds, but adjusted with the wobbling of the Earth. Then we have GPS which is TAI, but doesn't have any leap seconds. So there is a slight difference between these. And this diagram shows approximately what the difference is between these various time scale. The y-axis is, is the difference between atomic time, TAI, and the horizontal axis, x-axis, is the year. So you see that TAI and UTC was the same around 1958, 1st of January. And then UTC, which is the red line, is differing from the is is differing uh, from TAI. You also see that Lawrence C, GPS, Baidu uh, are all fixed from a specific point in time when it was exactly the same as UTC. And then because of leap seconds, UTC is differing more and more from each one of the other time scales. 
if you look at the difference between TAI and UTC, you see the difference here. There is some wandering going on, and then the, 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 each one of the leaps is when a leap second is added or removed. So you see here that the last leap second was added in, in 20, what does it end up being? 2017, 1st of January. Uh, 2018, 2019, nothing was, was added. So we might see a leap second in a few years. So what is so difficult then with, with frequency and time? Well, there, there are two different, if you had two clocks, and if we ignore the counting for a minute, you have two frequency sources, and there might be two different problems here. The first one is a frequency error. That is the distance between uh, two of these arcs in the frequency, the difference in frequency, the difference between A and B in this diagram. And then you have the second error is that A and B do not peak at the same time, and that is a phase error, which is C. So even if it is the case that A and B are individual, as uh, if you look at each one of them, they are very, very stable. It might still be the case that they have frequency errors and phase errors. But what you can do is that you can do correction on these two. And ultimately, if two clocks are going exactly the same, the frequency sources that the clocks are using have both the same frequency and they have zero phase error. The difference though, the difficult thing though, is that you have two different clocks, A and B, and you would like to check, make sure that B is equal to A. You have a certain propagation time from A to B, if nothing else, the speed of light. And as we all know, the speed of light, if you look at long distances and, and short time frames, you see that it's very, very difficult to actually, for example, make sure that the phase error is smaller than the propagation time or whatever mechanism you have to carry the time measurement from A to B. And what we are doing at Netnode, for example, and many other places and parties that try to have exact accurate clocks is that you try to get an accuracy down on single digit nanosecond. And the thing here is that the speed of light is about, uh, it's about one foot per nanosecond. So if you have two clocks, which is more than a foot apart, it is actually quite difficult to get the, um, the uh, to check the phase error. Uh, just the round tip time might have a variation, which is larger than the phase error that you can accept. So this turns into quite interesting engineering problem to make sure that two clocks are having uh, is having a, a phase error that is and frequency error that is smaller than propagation time of light. One example of this problem has to do with the the electricity network. If you look at the power system, the power network in the U.S., there is an interesting report, which is called Time Synchronization in the Electric Power System. Um, because they found that there was a problem with measurement of the electricity network in, in, in North America. If you look at the, uh, the uh, AC uh, distribution, in AC, you have a certain uh, frequency of the currency and you measure the error that, you, that is allowed in, degree, in percentage of the degrees. And just because you use 50 or 60 Hertz, depending on where you are in the world, and you allow a certain a quite small error, that means that when you measure the phase error of the power, you must ensure that the clocks of the various measurement mechanisms that you use is precise enough. Let's have a look at this. If it is the case that we have a 60 Hertz rotation uh, mechanism like this power, and you have a maximum error uh, of 1%, that means that things are not produced to be able to handle a greater error than 1% angle error. That is, that corresponds to timing an error of 26.5 microseconds. The problem though, is that the uh, standard suggest a maximum timing uncertainty of one uh, microsecond instead of 26.5. And if it is the case that, and you see that 1% angle error corresponds to timing error of 31.8 uh, microseconds, so um, a 1% angular is 0 0.0573 degrees. So one of the findings in this report, time synchronization electric power system, is that the, the precision and the accuracy of time in the measurement equipment that is used 
to measure the angle, the angle errors in the in the in the um, in the power network, the precision of the measuring mechanism was not enough to be able to measure the error. So, what they're looking at uh, in this specific case was how to distribute time and how to receive the measurement of the time error in the end user application. So, uh, so the, the actual measurement introduced a much greater error than what was allowed. So basically the conclusion is this measurement and, and, and uh, equipment that they were using did not help. And so it's not to surprise that the power network and power grid went poof. Another thing that they, that they discovered was that the equipment itself for measurement could not handle loop, leap seconds. So for 17 seconds, it was in fact a 36 degree error at 59.9 Hertz. And there were no report for the second immediately after the leap second and two reports for the 18 second after the leap second. And this also means that for uh, just after the leap second introduction in, 20, in June, 2016, no one really knew what was the state of the power grid in the US. Part of this is just because of what I call a bug or oversight in the post six, in the post six definition. Uh, the definition is kind of simple. It is 86,400 times the number of days since the 1st of January 1970. And within a day, it's the number of seconds since midnight. And because of that, when you introduce the leap second, as you see in yellow, you have uh, each row is one half second. So what you see is happening when the leap second is introduced is that the time when you call the post six calls, the time actually goes backwards. And this is something that is not really fun. And this is why Google introduced this smearing of the leap second so that the number of seconds, post six times seconds never, so that the clock never goes backwards. Um, and this is because the post six definition do not really take leap seconds into account. Um, if you want to know, uh, what time it is, a certain number of seconds in the future, that's a little bit difficult to know because you don't really know when leap seconds will be introduced. And this is one of the reasons why there are quite a resistance and uh, sorry, kind of a big support for removal of leap seconds. On the other hand, if we didn't have leap seconds, then we would suddenly release the requirement that the time we have is somewhat connected to the earth rotation around the sun. And the question is whether we can do that or not. The GPS have also similar kind of issues like the POSIX because inside the GPS signal, one week is a 10 bit, bit counter. And that means that the GPS signal is actually wrapping every two, two to the power of 10 weeks. And that's about 20 years. Uh, it was a wrap in April 7, uh, 2019. And yes, there were some equipment that actually went poof because there were equipment that was made that Oh, that hard coded that had hard coded what 20 year epoch as it's called it was going to work so it was the intention from the manufacturer was not that it would survive in production across april 7 2019 which is kind of funny um anyways so now it will take another like 19 years be before we have another wrap in the week counter in gps we will have leap seconds uh, before that so with that as a background, just to show that this thing with time is not really, it's not easy just if you, if you know what GUTC is, but even if you know what time scale you're using, it could be kind of interesting anyways to do this engineering wise. So once upon a time, Peter Lettberg that many of you might know, of, he ran NTP service, got interested in, in time and frequency. And over time, he increased the precision and stability of the clocks and Netno took over the operation in, uh, together with Peter around the year 2000. The regulator uh, PTS in Sweden start helping with financing from time to time. And ultimately we actually managed to get our act together here in Sweden compared to some other countries around us that, uh, that do not have definition of what their local time is. So this is what it looked like. These are pictures from Peter when he picked up the first clocks uh, in, in Russia. 
and this is what the time lab uh, looks like with some hydrogen emasers and stuff. Um, this is the old rubidium clocks that uh, that we used at NatNode. But what we have done, uh, it, but when we had those rubidium things up and running, everything worked quite fun, quite good. But what happened was that the uh, after the <clears throat> after the Anna Lind passed away, uh, the government launched an investigation about legal meteorology, time and frequency and provisioning. Uh, this uh, requested a special report on time. It's called Traceable Time and Frequency, Perfect Time Out. We thought the title was kind of cool. Anyways, uh, the report is good as well, not only the title. It's also the case that the, uh, uh, the group SAMFI has both in 2012 and 2019 pointed out that being able to coordinate time and frequency in Sweden is kind of important for multiple reasons. In this report in 2007, it's recommended that Sweden should have its own capacity to develop, maintain, and ultimately operate a function and system for the production and distribution of traceable time and frequency. We must further that we must decrease our dependency on DNSS and radio. And it's really important to have time and frequency traceable to UTC. And that is what we have tried to implement since then. And having NetNode running NTP, P2P, and NTS service is part of that. So the goals were to have long-term stable phase and frequency. The short-term is something that each consumer of time and frequency have to resolve themselves. We should realize the time scale. We should have P2P service with isolated interfaces between the customers. We should have NTP service facing the internet and an external sync mechanism. And this is resolved by having cesium clocks, multiple of them, uh, to measure continuous measurement of and steering of phase and frequency, multiple vendors, and also isolated interfaces in the equipment we have, uh, to make sure we have NTP and signed NTP, implement that on FPGAs so that it can handle any kind of denial of service attacks, and also to use common view DNSS and P2P and White Rabbit and, uh, and multiple other kind of things so we can synchronize these uh, clocks with each other. So we have PTS is an oversight and main financing of the core functionality. Net node develop and operates the nodes. We have the end users for P2P that finance the cost of their connection, but PTS is doing the main financing of the product. And then we have Visa that is maintaining UTC SP and participate in BIPM and behalf of PTS monitors the systems. We have clocks today in Stockholm and two locations in Malmö, Gothenburg, Sundsvall. We are deploying at the moment up in Luleå as well. It's not yet in operation, but will be during this year. So anyone interested can uh, get time of frequency at these nodes. Uh, a node looks like this. You have it consists of two half, you see that to the left, the two cesium clocks at the bottom, I will show that in a minute. And then to the right, we have extra batteries. That is because the cesium clocks are, and the frequency mechanist are not allowed to stop. Because if the electricity grid in Sweden stops, it need to boot uh, against our cesiums. So we need, to, we need to always exist. So we have a couple of days of extra uh, power for the CSMs, if the UPS for the computer room where we are, and the DSL that generates electricity, and the main power grid in Sweden all goes poof, then we can still make sure that these actually are keep up and running. And if that goes bad, then we really are in deep trouble. So, oops, here we are. So this is what it looks like. We have, if you start from the bottom, we have the frequency generator, which is a cesium. We have a frequency and phase adjustment box. We have a frequency amplifier, a measurement unit that measurement the frequency in the box. We have a frequency distribution for to the other tools. And then we have the consumers, which is P2P and GNSS. We have IP network management tools. Then we have NTP servers and some measurements and web servers on the top. The CSUs looked at this and each individual is an individual and over time, you learn how precise they are. They are very stable frequencies. It might not really be correct, but it's a stable frequency. So you learn and you do adjustment on it. Uh, here is the uh, time of frequency measurement and adjustment that can both do frequency and phase offset adjustments. 
and can also replicate from five, five, 10 megahertz and also one PPS. We're using five megahertz and one PPS in, inside the mesh. KB length is not measured in inches or meters. Measure, tie, length of cables is measured in seconds, uh, which you need to compensate for between each one of the boxes. So here you see cables which are 6.21 and 6.17 nanoseconds each. Uh, in the lab, when you measure and try to set things up, uh, it normally looks like this. This is some test of white rabbit equipment. You buy fiber, these two boxes that you see up to the left includes 40 for zero kilometers of fiber, each one of them. Of course, these are not fiber that is dig down into ground. It's actually a very nice fiber. It's, uh, it's in boxes and not very, not very weird, but it's still the case that you can do some testing with some, uh, some uh, fibers that are not as high quality and uh, around these, but you can, I, you can even, you, but you can try over longer distances uh, on your desk as well. This is the FPGA that we, that we are working with. Uh, it has four 10 gig interfaces. We have implemented NTP and sign NTP using symmetric encryption on the card. The daughter card on the top, just below the screwdriver is a little bit special edition. It is input for frequency from the, uh, from the time source that we just saw on the previous pictures. And so we are clocking the FPGA from an external frequency source. We are not clocking the FPGA from the computer the FPGA is mounted on. The computer is only used to managing the FPGA, not for anything else. The FPGA is completely standalone. And at the moment we're implementing an NTS in the FPGA, but we're not done yet. So the system approximately looks like this. We have a CCM frequency source. We use CommonView GNSS and also PTP. We do a phase and frequency adjustment that gives us the time scale. And then we make the time scale available using NTP and P2P and, and then also NTS. Uh, in this implementation that we have done, we have moved from, with the rubidium clocks, we have about thousand nanosecond plus minus, you see the, the errors here. We have moved to about 10 nanoseconds uh, with the cesium clocks. You see this is uh, a factor that quite, quite quite a good bit better. So we are within, within single digit nanosecond uh, if everything is, uh, is connected as, uh, as it should. Um, and of course it should, otherwise something is broken. Uh, we are well within, let's say 20 nanoseconds without any problems. And we should remember here between two clocks, which are for example in Stockholm and Gothenburg. And you should remember that uh, time, uh, sorry, the light goes one 30 centimeters per nanosecond. So this is actually quite good. So what about security and NTP? Uh, well, to be frank, key negotiation NTP, even though it's six in the protocol, is not possible to implement. There were not crypto people that come up with that idea. And so for signed NTP, you should use symmetric keys. And yes, we do support symmetric keys and some people are using it. On the other hand, we it's, it's a nightmare to handle symmetric keys, as you know, specifically for an organization that are not used to managing symmetric keys. So what everyone knows this, so there have been an improved version of NTP in the works for quite some time. Of course, people don't agree in the ITF. So in April, May, 2018, Netno decided that we should help. And this time it was not the kind of, we are from the government, we're here to help. We actually stepped in and helped quite heavily. Uh, this is dealt with in the NTS specification, which is now actually not version 20, it's version 22, I think, maybe 24 even. In reality, NTS are two loosely coupled protocols. We have the NTS key establishment protocol, NTS KE, which is a key extraction over TLS. And then we have NTP, the normal NTP, but with NTS extension fields. So you use a key extraction protocol over TLS to get some cookies, which you then place in the extension fields, and then you use normal NTP for time synchronization. So you have the NTS KE server, and then you have the NTS server. Yeah, we'll show that in a bit. Uh, so except for the initial NTS KE process, 
all state required by the protocol is handled uh, in the client in opaque cookies. So the ultimate protocol is very much like NTP. Originally, we had the client that got issued a query to NTP service, you get a respond back. So this is very simple, but we have done now with NTS is that you have the NTS KE server that shares some cookie encryption parameters. You have the client that start by negotiating parameters, initial cookie supply, generate keys, yada, yada, know what NTP service you talk to, et cetera. It gets that as a package from the server and then it uses authenticated time synchronization with the help of the extension fields for NTP v4. So this is the new architecture, which is you basically add the NTS KE server. So this describes a little bit how it works. You connect to the NTS KE server. Um, not strange, it's a normal negotiation over TLS. Uh, the whole idea is that it should only take one round trip after which the server closes the connection. Um, and then you have the time synchronization and this, the idea is that the client should be able to reuse the same cookie many, many times. So you don't need a handshake with the KE server every time you should issue an NTP query. The other way around, you should get a cookie and then you're done. And then you talk with your favorite NTP server. The NTP server can though say, I'm sorry, I don't know what this kind of cookie is. You had better go to the cookie jar and get a new cookie if you want to. Uh, so because the server responds with a fresh encrypted cookie at every request of the client then. So, so to, 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 to withstand replay attacks and such, such things. So the status of NTS was that it was stuck in ITF bureaucracy actually until Wednesday last week, <laughs> believe it or not. I was on my way to talk about how crappy the ITF bureaucracy was, but then it was approved uh, on March 25. So now we are done. So this will become an RFC. The actual RFC number is not assigned yet. The port number is not assigned, but we're now in, in the editing phase. So we're done. It's, it's a relief. It has taken almost two years of hard work, but I'm really, really happy that we at NetNode together with other companies in the world have managed to get NTS uh, implemented. It's also the case that in parallel, we have implemented the NTS server in software. There are also some NTS client software out there. And we do have, look at the URL down there. Uh, you can follow those instructions and quite easily get NTS up and running. We use the Kronos as basis for that. This is from my own server at home. I did this some time ago when on a Debian server, I compiled, downloaded and compiled uh, Kronos. And as you see in the, in the NTP log, you see that you actually do some handshake. And this is over IPv6. Everything is nice and dandy using the Let's Encrypt certificates. Everything is fine. And this is something completely different from the old uh, crappy UDP-based NTP uh, protocol that we are used to. So NTS is really, really, really the, the, the new black. So what are we in that node and what will happen here in Sweden in the next 12 months? You will see deployment of a node in Lulio. You will see more de deployment and development of the NTS protocol, including in the FPGAs. We are working on being able to calculate the time scale for NetNode, not only UTC for S for Sweden. Uh, today, we have a time scale for each one of the cities, but we would like to do something better than that. And that includes making data available so that people can validate what, what we are doing. We are continuously evaluate vendors' PTP equipment. Unfortunately, that's a dis depressing and not very fun exercise. PTP equipment, there are so few customers that actually want high quality PTP. So there are not many of them out there. Each one of them is fighting really, really hard, but they don't have many customers. So there's not enough sort of uh, money to actually do good PTP equipment. We are looking into White Rabbit, which is one protocol. We know the weaknesses of White Rabbit. It's better than P2P on long distances uh, over IP, uh, but we are going to test that on very long distances, uh, including optical ampl amplifiers on VDM networks to see what actually happens. It looks uh, quite good so far, actually. Uh, it's also the case that we see in Sweden and here in Scandinavia, quite a lot of jamming and replay attacks against DNSS. So for people that use DNSS uh, GPS receivers, that is, uh, stop doing that or, uh, or read some forthcoming reports from us. 
uh, the the attacks against GPS is not uh, is is not that fun actually. So what are my recommendations? Uh, the first one is that you should make up your mind of what time is. Measure the frequency and phase errors that you have against some kind of time frequency source. You can, for example, if, if you use GPS, if you if you use um, some other kind of thing, could use NTP to asset net node and or NTS even better and, and measure what the difference is. So you know the frequency and phase error. Uh, set alarms on that so you know when things start to, to wobble. You should also know the stability of the oscillators that you use yourself. Make a risk assessment of the errors and compare with the acceptable errors you have and also have warnings about that. And then for those interested, uh, I can recommend two books which are not very long, very interesting from sundials to atomic clocks, understanding time and frequency, and also longitude, the true story of a lone genius to solve the greatest scientific problem of his time. Um, so by Dava Sobel, the daughter of uh, the gentleman that implemented the accurate clock that he took to see. And I written a report myself on market-driven channel is to open internet standards, which talks a little bit about why it's so difficult to actually reach agreements uh, on, on standardized things, uh, which could be interesting to see now when not only Apple, but also Google and Facebook launched their own NTP servers in parallel with other NTP servers like the NetNode one that follows Swedish time. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much for this talk and dumbing it down so people like me were able to follow even. Uh, we have two questions here. And oh, and I need to tell everyone that two years ago we had this one talk by Alessandro Rubini at Force North uh, to, uh, 2016 about the approach, uh, uh, how they approach timing in Linux and hardware among thousands of systems at CERN. So you can go back and watch that <laughs> if you're interested because it kind of relates to what you've been talking about. So the first question was, uh, when you have multiple cesium clocks, which you need to synchronize over the boundaries of countries, how do you decide which one is the correct one? Uh, first of all, the, the cesium clocks only generate a frequency. So what you have to decide is which one of the frequencies is the one that you trust. What we are doing is that we are comparing our cesium frequencies with the frequency at SP, the Swedish UTC. And we, uh, we ensure that our uh, frequency matches the one at SP. And that, of, that is something that we should do, even if the cesium clock happened to be located in another country. So you always have to decide, as I said on the previous picture here, let's see if I can change picture. You need to make sure that you decide what is called traceable timer frequency. So you have to have something that you sort of is leaning and comparing against because there are differences between the various time sources and time scales. UTC is something that you only get to know a month afterwards. So you get to know today, you know, what error was it between the Swedish version of UTC and UTC a month ago. So you only know what error it was. And that's why it's a little bit difficult. Okay, great, thank you. And then the second question is, you mentioned the White Rabbit project. Is that the CERN project? That is, that is correct. It's a CERN originated uh, protocol that is called White Rabbit. Uh, White Rabbit after uh, the Alice in Wonderland, of course. Uh, so yes, it's the CERN White Rabbit, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks again for the talk. And uh, to you, now over to you, Johan. Oh, wait, uh, there's another question which showed up here. Let's take this one first. Most of us do not realize how much hard work is done to get the internet up and running, which with your experience, what is the most underestimated part of this work? I think the uh, the biggest problem is maybe that people think it is too easy 
if it is the case, well, let me take a step back. I want internet users and anyone building services to take for granted that the internet just works. Just like we take for granted that there is electricity in the wall plug and that there is water out of the water taps. Let me start there, okay. Now, all of us that are customers of internet service providers, we know it is not as good as the water in the water tap. <laughs> and we also know that of course, it's very difficult to make sure that there is always electricity in the, in the outlets in the walls. So what I think we should understand, all of us being customers, that there is a difference in quality between two different service providers. We cannot only compare what we are buying based on price because it is really complicated and doing things the right way actually costs some money. So I think we need to start to look for quality and we, all of us, we should be prepared on paying a little bit more to get higher quality things until we really can take it for granted, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Johan? Yeah, and I'd like to extend a thanks to, to everyone, uh, Patrick and all our speakers that we've had today, but also all our viewers. And with that, I would like to thank our speakers, our sponsors, and all our viewers.